The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talk station faith matters and welcome to the program good to have you with us on faith matters on the talk station i'm ben ball and i joined it today by reverend robert cornegy associate pastor of chapel by the sea in emerald isle and bishop doc loomis who is bishop in residence at all saints anglican in newport and good day gentlemen morning ben hello sir all right uh, well there is a phenomena <laughs> sweeping across the country uh, in this election, it's not uh, it's not some new fad, uh, but it is actually what may some may have thought was a fad. It seems to be hanging on and headed for uh, the nomination for the Republican side of the presidential ticket. And of course, we're talking about Donald Trump. And part of the reason that he is do- doing so well, uh, the Nevada caucuses were the, were earlier in the week when we were recording this. And there's more coming up. And part of the reason he was he was doing so well is because he's getting support from across the board, uh, across the demographics. Pretty much led every demographic that voted in the in the primaries where he has been victorious, and uh, in no small measure has been the evangelical uh, vote. There are a lot of articles. A lot has been written about this now, and just in the last week. Uh, but a couple of articles I chose for us to consider, one from Talking Points Memo, uh, their TPMDC column on politics, talks about why are evangelicals supporting the unrepentant Donald Trump. Uh, Tony Perkins has a message for evangelical voters this election season. Fear not or risk electing twice-divorced, one-time pro-choice gay sympathizer Donald Trump. We cannot be driven by fear, Perkins, president of the Family Research Council and a Ted Cruz supporter, told TPM in an interview this week on the heels of Trump's victory in South Carolina. When we are driven by fear, we make mistakes. Trump's support among evangelical voters has floored pundits. As a New Yorker whose name is plastered across buildings in the cities, Trump is synonymous with the capital of the secular society that evangelicals detest and Perkins warns against. And yet, Trump is resonating with the evangelical community, let me start there. All right, uh, um, Robert, uh, let's let's talk about this in terms of uh, uh, first of the evangelical vote, but also just the appeal of Donald Trump is obviously going across boundaries and and far from what some thought this election would be about, which would be about electing a strong conservative voice. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's just make sure. I mean, I think I got my numbers right. He he's pulling in about a third of the evangelical vote. Is that right? Is that what we're? What I, I read. A, I don't know if it was in this article or another article that I read. I, I saw where the the numbers actually have increased with each primary. Right. So it's probably thirty six percent. I think. It, I think was yeah, what I, I saw. think it's it's right around that. You know, so there's still two thirds that aren't. Let's just make that clear mm-hmm. so it isn't it isn't quite yet a tsunami although it's a good size wave <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but um yeah and it's um it's it's uh it's ro- he's rocking the boat you know he's rocking <laughs> the uh the uh, fishing boat and uh, for sure as you know using the analogy of uh being out on the Sea of Galilee, and the disciples were trying to figure out what was going on when the storm was raging, and uh, and they look in the distance and they see a form and they think it's a ghost. They're not sure quite what it is, and so there's there are a number of evangelicals are thinking right now it's Trump coming ac- walking across the water and is going to save uh, save the fishing trip, but uh, we just don't we don't know where this thing is going. The uh, evangelical vote is very split right now, so. Um, um, but this is uh, but this is true though. I mean, uh, again, with a now a basically a three person race, uh, you've got um, when you if you get numbers that are in the upper thirties and low forties, then you are doing well in Nevada now. In South Carolina, Trump won thirty four percent of the evangelical vote. It was higher in Nevada, 
In Nevada, he had more votes in his next two than Rubio and Cruz combined in the caucuses. So Doc, could, I'd say the proportion of evangelicals in Nevada is probably a smaller proportion than the evangelicals in South Carolina. Wouldn't you? I, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I, I haven't mean, seen those exit kinda, polls. Think about it. The <laughs> yeah, I mean the Bible Belt versus the the casino. Bill, you know, yeah. so, I mean, you know, you just got to be careful. You got to be careful with these media reports because they know how to use numbers to try to make things look the well, way they want them to fit the meme. You know, the, 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 in South Carolina, the uh, Fox exit polls, uh, pretty extensive. It just, it was incredible. I mean, there really was not a category that he did not lead. Yeah. Well, here's the, here's the premise of this Lauren Fox article from talking points. And that is, that we are being driven by fear and we're going to make a mistake. We're going to make a bad choice. So I think it's an absolute hoot that you just brought up the story of Jesus walking through the waves because the, the, the very thing that Lauren Fox is calling us to do is don't be driven by your fear. And the very thing Jesus says is fear not. Fear not. Exactly. And this is the, this whole Trump phenomenon. And the thing that one of the things are three things that make Trump so amazing, but one of them is clearly that a man is standing up and looking fear in the face and saying, "Uh uh-uh, and looking at America and saying, you don't have to be afraid, I've got this. And that's that really is playing incredibly well right now. It certainly is. Well, it played with Reagan, too, remember. I mean, you know, Reagan was one of those after the Carter administration. I mean, I lived through that period of life. The malaise that came across came upon our country, and the Iranian hostage crisis, and you know it. Well, there also the are post, lots of similar feelings. Post Watergate malaise, exactly. Too, so. And uh, so now, you know, we're kind of we're kind of in the in that same sort of circumstance. And you know of, what? We the, the funny the other funny thing about this article is, I actually don't I can't live with the premise that if you live in fear, you constantly make mistakes. Fear is a drug. We actually love fear. If yeah. we didn't love fear, there wouldn't be Six Flag theme parks. There wouldn't be <laughs> heck. There wouldn't be NASCAR. Right. We, we we love the idea of crashes and fear and danger. We wouldn't climb mountains. We there's so many things. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't even talk to my wife. But I love fear. And so when we have so in our times of intense fellowship, there's actually a good feeling that comes from fear sometimes. Yeah. And fear is if, if it is fear. Then I say, well, okay, so we're afraid. Here's Don; he's going to take care of it. But the other side of it is, we're just flat angry. Mm-hmm. I we think have, that's we the, have yeah. seen everything go kaput. And and Donald Trump, he's our biker thug. He's like the guy we know in the neighborhood who's got like the chain on his belt and whatnot. And when things get really bad, we know we can call him and he'll take care of it. He's going to step in. And and I think that's a piece of what has happened here very clearly is we've looked to Donald and said, hey, uh, this is out of our hands. This has become a mess. Uh, would you and some of your buddies come in and, you know, don't don't tell us what you're going to do. Yeah. We, don't, we don't know anything about it. It's very mafioso in its own way, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, Representative Duncan Hunter, who, who is backing Trump now, he he has been a renegade. He's been one of those yeah, in Congress, has. and and uh, and he said, uh, "Well, what we need now is not a policy wonk, but a leader." Right. Uh, and so that's where he is uh, again uh, dumbfounding some of the pundits who thought the values voter, the evangelical voter, wouldn't turn to somebody who's what twice divorced and and uh, on his third foreign wife or whatever so uh uh so this is a um um this is a this is a conundrum i think for a lot of people and the other article that i i uh, brought to your attention was from why evangelicals are born again uh, for donald trump it's from the daily beast the column i <laughs> saw, saw the heathen we need um says Why are conservative Christians embracing a vulgar New York secularist? One of the things that they ask is, why are Southern evangelicals pro-Trump? Is is this a huge or huge uh, break from their voting pattern? The answer is yes, in part. But when you step back and understand the Trump phenomenon within the context of the culture wars, it makes more sense why Southern evangelicals will be open to his message. We know how Southern evangelicals typically impact the Republican presidential stakes. You only have to look back at 2008 and 2012 when Mitt Romney was repeatedly dogged by accusations that he was only pretending to be pro-life. 
Um, Romney had to construct an entire narrative of how his opinion on the issue had shifted. We don't see Donald Trump having to do this. Uh, and I think it goes to what you said, uh, is that people are angry. Um, I had a caller on our show in the morning that said, said I, I want a wrecking ball. That's who, why I'm voting for Trump. I want a wrecking ball to this uh, to government. Yeah, I, the, the evangelical group loves Donald Trump for the same reason they love the United States Marines. I mean, that's what we're we are we we've gotten to the place right now where we're we're they kind of at know war. No, have to kill people, we're, blow stuff up. Yeah, we're at we're kind of at war with our own government right now, and this is you know a, a piece of my thinking is. Uh, and I expect to lose a couple friends about this, but if there's an advantage to a Donald Trump, it's that here's a guy who's going to come in and do what needs, and we all know that things need to be done. We know it needs to be done with the reforms under the Obama administration. We know that things have got to get fiscally cleaned up. We know we've got to eliminate the debt that we've got right now. And Donald Trump says he's going to do that. All right, well, I say that's great. But, again, it's just it, I love him the way I love the United States Marines. I would love, it, you know, if just angels would float down on clouds and make it all better. Mm -hmm. But in the end, this guy's got to go in there and mix it up. Mm. So I'm voting for. Well, see, now next, segment, next yeah. episode. <laughs> yes. Yeah, some have said that this is uh, the end of the two party system if uh, he gets uh, elected or even nominated that matter so we'll, we'll look at that too uh, coming up in a moment and how does that uh, form by our faith and our experience uh, here on faith matters on the talk station fm 107 and am 1240 Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Thanks for joining us here today, Bishop Doc Loomis, Reverend Robert Corgi, and I'm Ben Ball. And we were talking in our first segment about uh, the Trump phenomenon and uh, and about how how he is being so well received by evangelicals. Uh, Robert, you said you uh, watched a little bit or, or of his appearance at Regent University uh, yesterday, right? At um, yeah, he uh, was there yesterday. And so I saw it this morning on the on Pat Robertson's show. I, I, I wanted to watch it because I knew we were going to be doing the segment, and this was the latest interview, particularly after the Nevada, Nevada, Nevada how do you say it? Nevada. 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 <laughs> Not the Nevada, Nevada um, caucuses, mm -hmm. and, uh, which is just a bizarre thing. I still don't understand caucuses, but that's another, that's another program. <laughs> but yeah. anyway... Um, and uh, it, it was it was fascinating the way they they you know, of course this is a media organization CBN so they did a media presentation on it and it was basically excerpts from his speech and then a sit down with uh, Pat and uh, David Brody I think it is mm -hmm. that's the, um, the their kind of political correspondent and they were asking different questions and and it was it was uh, amazing. How um, but Pat's, in fact, Pat's response to it was, you inspire us. Now, he didn't give an endorsement or anything, you know, official right. endorsement. They're doing it with every one of the candidates. So this, I think this weekend it's going to be Cruz and next week it's going to be Carson and they've already done Bush and they've already done Kasich. And so they're running through the Republican Mm -hmm. uh, candidates. And uh, so it was, it was Trump's turn. And, uh, but, um, the, the fascinating thing, there was that discussion about the difference between a, um, a, a constitutional Republic, the form of government and a theocracy. <laughs> and, and, you know, these articles that, that we have, particularly from the daily beast, you know, the, the, which is a very liberal mm -hmm. website. And uh, the Daily Beast, they love to position uh, Christians as wanting to create a theocracy. You know, we want, we want the, the, the pastor, <laughs> you know, the nation's pastor. We want Billy Graham to be our president. You know, because then we could just get everything straightened out kind of thing. Or or maybe some won't Franklin. You know, that may be a better choice for others. <laughs> right. But, um, um, and uh, so there was this discussion about, how, how, you know, a bit about his faith and how it, how it affects the way he's running. 
And his, his emphasis was really not on faith. faith. His emph- emphasis was on family. He, he focused mm-hmm. on the family, um, Trump, and talked about that the measure of success of a, of a person is not their bank account. It's the, looking at their family. And he said, I'm probably the last one that should be talking about this. So it was a very interesting kind of turn that he took. Because there wasn't the big ranting, it's going to be great, it's going to be wonderful, it wasn't any of that stuff. It was much more... There were actual whole sentences. Yeah, he actually <laughs> okay. had a conversation about these yeah. things. So, yeah, I want to go back and look at it again because it was, it was pretty interesting um, how, he, how he couched it. Now, is it important to anyone, I don't think it is, frankly, for Trump supporters, whatever his motivation might be? To, to run. I mean, uh, he says his motivation is, uh, he, although it really hasn't changed because he toyed with the idea in uh, the last two elections. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is his motivation, is it, um, is it clear or, or do we really even care about any candidate's motivation for running? Doc, what do you think? Well, uh, I think the word deconstructionalist comes to mind. It, it, that's a word that that falls in the lexicon, just short of anarchist. Mm-hmm. And I think he's. You, we see that actually. We've seen it in the church movement. If you look at the church movement over the last forty, fifty years, you've seen a move toward deconstructionalism, taking apart stodgy old institutions, throwing out their liturgies, mm-hmm. uh, changing their laws, making them more accessible, uh, that kind of thing. And so we could drive from end to end of the county here and go to any number of churches where we might not see a cross present, where we certainly wouldn't see priests in in mm-hmm. robes or collars or anything like that. That's a deconstructionalism. There's an element to that of that in um, in the zeitgeist right now. There's people looking at a bloated government, looking at things and programs that don't work, things that are being imposed on us and saying, we really need to tear a lot of this stuff down. And I think what Donald Trump is, and this is kind of this funny. This is what he represents. This is, he's, yeah, he's the ultimate in yeah. governmental eminent domain, Yeah, which is funny <laughs> because they made fun of him over this eminent domain. They were trying to make some, you know, get a little mileage out of that. But the reality is that's what people want. They want somebody to go in there and pull up all this corruption and pull up all this bloatedness and get us back down to something that makes a little bit more sense right now as a government. Well, Yeah, and that's why I brought up that thing. He's a businessman. He's a marketer. He knows what people he he has heard what the 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 shouting is going on, and when you've got a Congress, a government that's at eleven percent approval rating, mm-hmm. is where we are right now. You know, so his big his his shtick, if you will, well, it, is that is um, you know anti um, um, incumbent and those that are in there now. Mm-hmm. You know, they, he doesn't have a problem with government u- using force to accomplish its w- the will of the people. It's just that we got the wrong people in there doing it. So we need to get the right people in there, and and that's why there's a different there's a difference between say the Cruz well, group and the Trump group because the Cruz group is more of a shrink government, reduce it down, get it smaller, get it back where we can we can manage the beast and and I don't think that's Trump's at all. Trump's is triumphalism, you know. No, it's it, we're going to fix it all. Government can can be run done right, so it fixes everything. Well, his his idea is not that it's not that it's too big, but it's wrongly applied. Correct. So uh so uh and I think that's actually on the Democrat side. One of the reasons a lot of Democrats have been disaffected with the Obama administration is they felt like they, they were promised change and it really ended up being kind of still run the same way that the White House has always run. Uh it, it just a different occupant in it. Uh, well, yeah, so and the sense. changes so, there were changes but the changes were so poorly managed mm-hmm. and poorly administered. That it was like, whoa, you know, we agreed with the intent, but we don't agree with the consequence. Look what's happened. It's gone just the opposite well, it, of what, it, we, what you promised it would be. So, uh, and that's in a lot of different areas. Now, know? now some would say that's also the danger of a, of a Trump president. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And uh, I think we're seeing a kind of, you know, knee-jerk reaction. 
boom, to what has happened. And now the Daily Beast brings up this whole thing from the cultural warfare perspective. They love that stuff. Oh, yeah. And they love to analyze, you know, good liberals. They love to analyze cultural warfare. And they, they're claiming victory and that Bush is the, uh, is the con- I mean, um, Bush, <laughs> and that Trump is the consequence of that, um, mm-hmm. that, that loss of the, of the war, the cultural war. So, um, yeah, I mean, that. Well, so now uh, you can see by both, I think both your arguments here are saying that uh, Trump actually could be successful for conservatives uh, if if that is the where the wind is blowing. If that's the, if that is the will of the people, uh, he may actually be the one who will exercise that will. What do you think, Doc? Boy, uh, I would hope so. That is kind of the way our government was set up. I mean, it's really not as pejorative as simply a, a marketing scheme. I mean, we really were set up that the will of the people would be carried forward by the by those who govern us. And so uh, my hope would be that any politician would embrace that style of government. And I, I certainly hope that Donald Trump will. I, I just think he, has an, he will have an ability... Um, he has he has an ability to inspire, and I think that, that and that's what Pat said. And, yeah. and I think that is the thing we haven't seen since Reagan. Mm-hmm. We haven't had somebody who stood up and and really you know the, the light on a hill concept and really inspired us to be an America. The conservative that Christian could be what America evangelical side politically hasn't had that. No, right. that's right. Yes, because that's look, Obama was very inspiring to the uh, other side, to those that have have hit, share his worldview. I mean, remember that? This sure. Was, uh, I mean, it yeah. was it was, you know, um, it, it, it was groundbreaking. But, 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 was, but of course, they're very different arguments because Obama's, very, Obama's right. argument was, "You don't have anything. I'm going to give you everything." Right. And, and I think what Trump is saying is, "The government took everything away from you. I'm going to give it back." Right. And those are actually very different things. And the enterprise is going to do that precisely. Yeah. Okay. Not not the man. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, I think as evangelicals, as Christians. The, the trap in all of this is that we, we start getting our, our hopes on the wrong thing. Yeah, and, and the best thing I think we can hope for right now is that whereas, whereas Obama made it sound like government was going to be our savior, but it actually wound up being all about him, right. I'm hoping that Trump, in making it all about him, is actually going <laughs> to let government do what government actually can do. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, you you mentioned the line of uh, Reagan's line of a city on a hill uh, is 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 the line I'm going to build the tallest wall. Is that the same thing? I mean, is that the is that the kind of inspiring uh, message? Boy, he hit a nerve, didn't he? Yeah, With that, he did when he brought that up. I mean, that has been probably uh, evidently one of the most frustrating things. Forget about the evangelical side of it, any of that. I mean, evangelicals uh, tend to be um, keepers of the law, right? I mean, you know, our, our whole modus operandi is law, lawfulness. Right. We, we embrace the law. We, we believe there's order and there's function and, and um, you mm-hmm. know, way to hold back the chaos is through this. And so when we see our, our immigration laws just being flaunted and ignored, uh, it, it, can, it can drive us around the twist, as my Scottish friend used to say. And that is the number one conservative issue, period, in the United States right now. Back to your marketing. Yeah. Okay. More to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with uh, Reverend Robert Cornegy and Bishop Doc Loomis. And uh, now I want to turn our attention to the other big event uh, from uh, since the last time that we met. It was uh, the Justice uh, Antonin Scalia's death and how that is going to change the uh, the matters before the court and also the, the makeup of the court or the potential for that change there, too, from the Politico. Uh, Scalia's death could change court on abortion, race, climate. Cases on the docket could alter American life on many issues. Justice Antonin Scalia's death could change the courts of history on the contentious 
uh, social and legal issues pending before the Supreme Court this term, especially in closely divided cases where he was expected to serve as a linchpin of a conservative majority. In cases where the eight remaining justices are evenly divided, appeals court rulings would be left to stand, but no precedent would be set for future cases. The justices could also hold cases and leave stays of lower court rulings in place while awaiting confirmation of a new justice, but it's unclear if they would do so for nearly a year. Well, they, there's precedent that has been done, uh, but uh, and and they also um, they have heard cases, and then when they've had an appointment, they've reheard them. Right. So that's also the court basically, you know, if they want to do that, they could do that. Right. <laughs> so uh, it, it is. This is, I think, maybe the crucial um, uh, issue. I think in this upcoming election is going to be. Uh, or, or because there's not going to be there's not going to be a, a nomination that's going to pass through the Senate uh, before the next president is inaugurated. Very unlikely. Yep. I think it's I think it's high. there's been some move uh, some uh, <clears throat> senators are saying that they're willing to hold hearings. It still doesn't mean there's going to be a vote. Right. So I, I really doubt it. I, I, th- I think it's I think it's less likely than uh, than Bernie Sanders getting a the, the nomination on the on the Democrat side. So, um, given that, then is this uh, an issue also of those for people of faith about where we may want to pull the lever depending on what we think is pending before the court? Doc, what do you think? Whether well, you mean in terms of a presidential candidate, Ben? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually don't think it's going to be the issue of the election. I, I hear people say that all the time, but if you look at what the largely you know Republican-controlled Senate has said, is we're just not going to do this. In other words, we're going to take this off the table right now and not make it an election issue. Now the Democrats will try to put it back on the table and say, well, if you wait and if you don't vote for us, we're going to have another conservative. But gosh, I, that's. That's an old argument. I mean, whoever's in office has the constitutional authority to put somebody in place. I don't see it as as big an issue as the media is making it right now. Mm-hmm. Let me just say that. One thing, uh, Robert, the Politico article makes a point of, and this could, you know, this could happen, is that if it's a, if it ends up being a split vote on an eight-person court, it will go to the appeals court decision. The appeals Correct. court decision may stand, mm-hmm. and we have seen notoriously uh, some liberal decisions being upheld in the appeals court and uh, decisions that have gone against uh, what many people of faith. Yeah, that's true. There's some on both sides. I tell you, we really haven't talked about it on the air, but um, Antonin Scalia was one of my heroes of the court because I, 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 as a, as an American, I tend to be an originalist when it comes to constitutional issues. And so I believe that, that, um, you know, you do follow. And as a Christian, I believe in the rule of law and and that there are things that we need to we we need to be good citizens and so part of being a good citizen <clears throat> is trying to ensure that we abide by the 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 rule of law it's not feelings it's not um you know mob rule that kind of thing it's mm-hmm. rule of law and so to lose and and Scalia was was probably the strongest um or most um um pugilistic <laughs> combatant in the in the those issues he mm-hmm. he wrote volumes about you know, protecting the that originalist position and that it that the constitution is is not a living document you know that there are ways to change the constitution and we need to make if if if, if it is to be changed we need to go through all of that mm-hmm. and so to have lost him now is um, is just a major blow, I think, to this nation. It's going to have. I agree with that. That that it, it is a it is a very consequential um, uh, event, a tragedy, really, and uh, that that we have to be so careful. So, from my point of view, I believe it it could be, and and frankly, I think it it should be made an issue of um, who will. Um, um, who will make, make that, the recommendations? Make recommendations. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, it is even with a if a if a Democrat's in the White House, even if there's a Republican-controlled Senate, someone will eventually get confirmed. Now, uh, and that that's been the history. So, uh, even though uh, several have been turned down, 
uh, in the Senate, voted down. Someone will eventually get confirmed. So uh, you you do have an interesting thing here. One of the things I actually I liked about Scalia is because he brought to the bench what I wish was more true in Congress was a collegial combativeness. Right. I mean, exactly. he still was very collegial to, I mean, his best friend on the court was Ruth, Ruth. Bader Ginsburg. Exactly. Uh, and who is probably you know, the polar opposite of him uh, politically and or, or on constitutional matters. And I think that's sorely lacking in, in much of politics. But uh, this is still, I think this is a, this many issues that are going to come before the court and it be a divided court will come down to probably the chief justice and and, and Anthony and Kennedy. Um, Correct. Uh, in the which way they will go. Because we've seen John Roberts, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, vary. Yeah, you know, his, his opinion hasn't been a strict constructionist. In fact, Scalia has right. scolded him in the past, and we know where Sotomayor and Ginsburg and the others are. They're, yes, everybody's—they've right. got a pretty good track record. We know where they're going right now. Exactly. On the on the good side, um, there are some there are some decisions which, if they if they do come out uh, at an even split, uh, the abortion issue, by example, the that came out of Texas. The uh, appellate court uh, allowing Texas to allow put in restrictions, place yeah. restrictions on those abortion clinics. That would be something that would likely stand in a four-four. So mm-hmm. there's some good sides to it and some and some bad sides. But the bottom line is, I would hope that every election cycle, as we're choosing an American president, we would be thinking, what is that American president like? How is that president going to shape our government specifically? How is he going to shape our courts? He or she going to shape our courts? And so I again, I just. I, I don't want to beat up the issue, but I don't think it's as big a deal as 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 the press is making it right now. I'll be surprised if if it changes the mind of a voter hmm. in this particular climate. Yeah, well, I would say it's an issue that needs to be discussed. Yes, because what we've seen is that the Democratic side tends to go kind of towards an affirmative action mo- model of putting people on the you know, you got to get your court. demographics right. Right. You know, so the, and and yeah, that's nothing new. That's been there all for a long time, but uh, but it seems to have been been somewhat more um, aggressive in the um, in the this like, term. Except for Justice Thomas, it didn't count for the Republicans. Right. <laughs> no, that's right. But what will look bad is if the president does put forward a moderate, and you know, the court's usually divided. We tend to think of liberals, conservatives, and moderates. If he does put together even a conservative leaning moderate. And then the Senate still refuses, Mm -hmm. doesn't even get through the Senate Judiciary Committee, the Senate refuses to talk to him. Then what, then the pile on is the, the, the do nothing, no, no. Right. Senate. Yeah. And that yeah. doesn't bode well going yeah. forward. Yeah. I, I, well, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I think the advice and consent role of, uh, of the Senate isn't to just to be obstructionist. And, you know, so I, I tend to, I tend to favor that if you get elected, if you're in that position, uh, it, unless your nominee has committed high crimes and misdemeanors, and they pretty much ought to go through. Uh, but, um, uh, mm-hmm. but a lot of people don't, don't feel that way. No, no, they don't. On, on either side. Right. On either side. <laughs> It isn't just the Republican side or the, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's become so politicized Mm -hmm. that, you know, we're seeing decisions handed. I mean, the Supreme Court was never intended to be the the oligarchy decision maker of the nation. I mean, it it was their three equal branches of government. Right, and the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, and and they they have a re, they have the relationship, mm-hmm. but it's gotten so distorted now, coming from the originalist position, is that I you know I, w- there's some there's some um, supreme is not kingly, yes, no, and Scalia really was the anchor that was holding the entire the Supreme one, Court exactly. from going off the edge into right. the world he of politics. He brought that up yeah. constantly, right. Yeah. And and uh, that voice seems to be gone now. I don't know. Alito likely is going to is probably going to rise as the uh, one who is the mm-hmm. the, the, the originalist. Voice. I would say yeah. um, Thomas, of course, is there. But uh, Roberts, he's um, he's he's been pretty much in the middle for a lot of yeah, a lot of issues. Yeah, I mean he he with the with the um, the the um, ACA ruling, the um, mm-hmm. Affordable Care Act. Um, decision that was mm-hmm. that was so unconstitutional. Well, he what they did. He converted it to a tax. Exactly. So. 
So the the uh, but the argument uh, for your nominee uh, going through uh, is not it's not supposed to be reflective of your own presidency, but how you're looking out in the long view. But but we haven't seen that. I mean, we have, but we have plenty of surprises. There have been plenty of surprises on the court. People who thought they were going to be, they were nominating one uh, who of one certain ilk who turned out not to be that case when it, mm-hmm. when it came time. They say that it does change you when you get to the court, when you get to that level yeah. of the court. Yeah. So, but, but as people of faith, though, we look at a lot of issues that are, that are coming up uh, about free speech and, well, and religious the, freedom. Abortion. Yes. I mean, that's one of the big issues that's probably going to be be a, a big deal about the contraception issue with the with the um, what are they called the sisters of the poor or mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. is it yes that's yeah. right. separation of church and state issues right period. this yes. is this yes. is huge 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 excuse me huge yeah and this is and this is where the part of politics where electing a person who has a moral compass focused on Christ is actually important because they're likely to put somebody on that course on that court that has a moral compass Right now, we don't have that in the White House. And frankly, with a Donald Trump, we probably won't either. And with a Hillary Clinton, probably not either. More to come in a moment on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And uh, thanks for joining us here today. Did I interrupt your discussion about where lunch is going to be? Is that (laughs) <laughs> yes, <laughs> sounds like Cox today. That's, that's our, our last segment that often comes up, uh, and uh, and welcome to our last segment here. I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Robert Cornegan and Bishop Doc Loomis. An article that comes from Baptist News Global is interesting. I think for a lot of a uh, lot of churches here today, it's called Trading Membership for Discipleship, helping helping churches and Christians. Young people especially are not interested in being members of churches or of any institutions, experts say. So in the best interest of congregations to redefine themselves as places from which disciples go to serve the world. So, uh, Robert, you often have spoken about it in your time with Mercy Ships, uh, especially has come up, about the two hands. Yeah. The two hands. Uh, speak about that for a second. Yeah. Well, it's the... Um It's the the uh, blah blah blah. <laughs> He's got food it's on Nevada. It. <laughs> I'm thinking about lunch already. Yeah, Come right, on, right. give me a break. Right. No, the um, the the outreach part of our faith. You mm-hmm. know, the the action part of our faith. There is the internal and there's the external. Mm-hmm. And so there's the vertical and there's the horizontal to get all the uh, right. references in there. But there is that personal relationship, that mm-hmm. vertical relationship with God through Christ and the Holy Spirit that we have that is the the catalyst, really, for us, for our horizontal relationships into our families, into our communities, into the world, right. and uh, wherever God calls us. And, and uh, he calls us to all of those, quite frankly. But um, um, being able to express in a, in a local church setting this vision of, of being agents of change into into our communities, uh, particularly, I think, is where uh, having an influence on our, our mm-hmm. community is, is kind of the, that's the laboratory where we get to learn how to to be compassionate to people that we may not know or may not con- possibly be familiar with or be uh, or even like um, because of um, different reasons, but. You know, where we can kind of break that barrier. And so that is the follower of Jesus model Mm -hmm. rather than a church member model. The story, and, uh, so that's really what the article is all about. Yeah, the story uh, written by Jeff Rumley uh, talks about a, a Methodist church that has 2,500 on the rolls, 850 in worship every year, and about 130 new members every year. And says uh, uh, they talk about uh, membership class with the people under 40 <clears throat> coming in with kids. It says the problem, he said, talking to about the pastor, Michael Guffey, uh, says that, uh, that the concept of church membership Membership in anything doesn't resonate with most young most young people. So we decided to do something different, he says. What Shannon United Methodist did was join the discipleship movement, which encourages lay people and ministers to focus on their callings rather than on their status within an institution. Uh, you'll find actually his his just the numbers of here to me reveal some things because you'll find churches that appeal to maybe a non-traditional crowd will have higher attendance than they have members and they have membership. Uh, and in the Methodist Church, it has been a struggle 
from hierarchy on down about talking about members about losing members you know you you you're you're judged on the, the members that you bring into the church and are they professions of faith are they transfers and instead uh now there has been more of an emphasis or talk about discipleship but the, the numbers game still is there right so uh but discipleship mm-hmm. uh, and wesley wesleyan terms was uh works of mercy and wor- and works of piety uh, in order to as means of grace so both the idea of your internal as you're talking about your study your prayer right. fasting those things and then your works of mercy when you're reaching out to the community you're doing mission work so um uh, in the in the anglican view over there are are you seeing this struggle too over numbers versus discipleship well if you focus on members you will get them Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a rule. If you focus on disciples, you will make them. It's really a choice, and it's a choice that was made for us biblically by a guy named Jesus who <laughs> who told us which one Go was out. the one that he wanted us to do. Yeah. So it's a no-brainer, really. Well, I've been an advocate of non-membership for uh, a long time. It It is more, as you know, Ben, what we do here in the community is develop cross-denominational and ecumenical gatherings where people come together uh, based on a like-mindedness about something that they do, mm-hmm. that is the, a mission of the hand that's out there doing the thing. And we bring those people together, find out that it works really well, and we don't really we don't really have to worry about membership. This is a challenge. I mean, the Church of England, by example, has 25 million members, uh, about 700,000 of which actually attend a parish on any given Sunday. And that's the, that's a real challenge. It's, it's not just a matter of whether you're a member or whether you're disciples. We have this, this church, one third of its people come to church. Mm-hmm. That means that two thirds of its people are at home. That's, and that's. Well, and that's the same numbers in this church, actually, that they were examining. That's, yeah, that's, that's yeah. this one right here, right? Yes. And it, it, again, it all comes down to are we going to do what Jesus said or not? Mm-hmm. This isn't this isn't some wonderful move that culturally is relevant because today kids don't want to be members of anything. Right. This is you're going to get what you shoot for in church every single time, and if you and if if if, if members is what you're after, you, believe me, you can find them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do a we do have members of our church, and we have associate members of well, our church. Well, stop it! No, I'm not <laughs> because what we do is we do an orientation to what it means. We we we're pulling people from all kinds of backgrounds in our church. Now, you're a particular denomination. We're a cross denomination. No, we church. no, we are. I can assure you, we have more denominations in our little church than you do and we we do the same thing wonderful <laughs> class we bring them all together we tell them all about the, why we wear girls clothes on sunday and what the smoke means we do all the same stuff we don't wear girls clothes on sunday so that, just want to let you folks know if you're looking for a church without girls clothes you can come to chapel by the sea but the point right. i was going to make <laughs> women, women in pants right uh-huh. the point i was going to make was that uh um we use that time to teach the kind of the dna Mm-hmm. Of, of 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 Christianity, of evangelicalism, if you will, you know what it is as a, an evangelical church, a, 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 right. a, mem- a, a member in that case, but a a, a follower of Christ. This mm-hmm. is where we go. This is how we do it. And so we found it useful in trying to get everybody on the same page, mm-hmm. so that their expectations are clear. Um, because and and even after having done that, we still have those that just show up on Sunday, and that's they're, they're not involved in any of the activities of the church or the the opportunities that are through the church. Sure. But but the intent uh, and and when we go through it, we begin with the the vertical, with the internal. We mm-hmm. talk about that relationship with Christ, and then we move into the horizontal, the external, and how that works out. And every everyone is expected to um, to kind of. Um, search their hearts, their calling, and what is it that God is calling them into, and and either join in with something that we're doing already, or start something right. <laughs> that's that's well, uh, in their, their it's, line. It's also important to explain why you're doing missional things, or why you do projects, or those things. I, I think so, and I, I, I actually I came back after we did a we were doing a yard sale. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and it had a fundraiser towards kids' missions and things like that. Uh, and I, I said in church afterwards, I said, I know there's several of you that could have stroked a check for all that 
for you know, instead of having to come out here on a rainy Saturday and, right. and do all the work that we ended up doing. I know that you could, but that's not why. That wasn't the only reason for doing that. But it was also to reach out and talk to people in the community to be good neighbors and bring those p- folks together in a in a place. So there's more to it sometimes than what appears to be the objective. Yeah, the communion and, of the saints. Yeah, and so I mean, you know, just that community uh, coming together, right? But I think there are some times when we see that pendulum swing, you know, of membership to discipleship, and what constitutes discipleship. Is it just going out and building ramps for people that have no idea who you are and what you right. come from, or or is it uh, or is it about still taking the message of Christ uh, in in both its uh, physical way and in a um, and in a um, spiritual way? Yeah, so, and and that really is it, isn't it? And that's right. the two hands reference is, is really the truth that you, you it's not an either or it's a both, and yeah. that you do it it's it opens opportunities for developing relationships with people further than you ever have probably i'm always reminded there's a great saturday night live skit uh uh will farrell and i forget who the woman that was doing it with him uh, may have been sherry terry but anyway she they, they were doing the a uh, um a manger scene a live manger scene and they volunteered to be joseph and mary mm-hmm. have you seen this one yes, and they yeah. volunteered to be it and and they had no idea of the story they had no clue about the story of the birth of Christ at all. And they were asked, why are they doing it? It says, so we can get to heaven. Yeah. So it, it, to me, it's, a, it's an example of mm-hmm. you have to have the foundation, too. You've got you to work and develop, and that um, involves self-discipline to also study, to read, and, and, and be part of worship, as well as going out and then doing those things like being the live major scene <laughs> uh, externally. Mm-hmm. Doc, what do you think? I think so many things right now. Um, one of the things I think is that the focus of the church is to is to assist people in becoming members of the body of Christ and not of the local parish. That's just how I feel about mm-hmm. it. I know I'm not going to change either your minds or the Methodist convention or whatever, but it is for me, it, uh, you're going to get what you focus on. Mm-hmm. If you focus people's attention on Jesus... Um, they'll see Jesus. If you focus them, uh, their attention on the local parish, uh, they will see the local parish and you'll reap what you sow. All right. Uh, and that wraps it up for another session of Faith Matters here on the talk station. Uh, thank you, Dr. Loomis, uh, Bishop Dr. Loomis, and Reverend Robert Cornegy. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. production of the talk station.